So welcome everyone back after lunch. So what I want to do now is to, to show you a little bit about how the quality of eJeopardy is uh, kind of guaranteed or is worked on by process one by testing in a certain way. So I will present a new way of testing that you probably haven't seen or have any one of you come across property-based testing quick check before? No? So this is new for you? I will, that's what Miguel said. They probably haven't seen it yet. So, so be gentle and, and explain it slowly. So I will do that. I will do very simple things only. And then we'll show you how this works. Uh, a bit of a demo. So I like to, to demo you a little bit how, how things work. Um, so that, that's what I will do for today and see where we go from there. So that if you have questions, interrupt me. No problem at all. And uh, we'll go. So we have been uh, working with Process One for a long time already, uh, dating back, I think, to 2006 or something, when we had the first approach from uh, Mikael. He said, you know, I have this fantastic EJBD server, but sometimes, and that was a very long, long time ago, sometimes if you were present in the chat, you left the chat and people sent you a message, then for the user sending the message, it appeared that the message had come to the other user. But the other user never saw it because um, it had already been logged out. So the presence wasn't synchronized with sending the messages. So what you should do is, of course, you buffer the message. Next time the, the person comes in, it will show the message and say, OK, fine, now, now I've seen that. At that time, that didn't really work. There was a race condition between logging out and sending that message, which is a time interval which was annoyingly big to, to this actually happening in practice. And we had then made some tests to actually trigger that, that thing by exploring a lots of different combinations. So this is kind of the first thing. And since then, we have worked together a little bit to, to test EJBD. Let's do a step back. Why is testing hard? Or do you experience testing as being something simple? Covering all the edge cases. There are so many cases. There's so many things you have to think about. So you have so many features. Oh, I see the S should actually be there. But there are N features in a process, in, in things. So features are typically things like Christopher uh, talked about, like uh, we have multi uh, broadcast to, to, to more than one person. So the broadcasting is a feature. You have non -anonymous, anonymous rooms. So the rooms which you can have non anonymous. You have uh, access rights. Are you, are you able to publish or are you not able to publish? There's another feature. And all those things can be called features. So if you want to test them, and you have n features, well, then you would probably write three to four tests per feature in order to, to actually test that this, this feature is, is covered well by the software. So that means that you get a, well, I don't know if you know the symbol, or a linear number of test cases when you write this, order n test cases, big O n. So you get a linear number of test cases. But what now? if you want to test that each pair of feature also is fulfilled. So you can test logging in or publishing a message for to one user and saying, I'm allowed to do that, I'm not allowed to do it. Now you test one feature. But now you want to test the same in combination with the one user case and the multi-user case, of course, the, the, the chat room where you have more than one user. So then you get and square test cases if you want to write the test for each of those combinations of features. And you better do that because otherwise you're going to bump your head into the wall, right? It's never really nice to have n square test cases. So if you have 20 features, as Christopher showed you in the end of the slide, so oh, you can configure the system like this, and you, he listed 20 features, you have to write 400 test cases. Not so nice. But if you work hard, you would do that. What about triple of features then? Can you test them, those? Well, now it gets really, really annoying, right? Because 20 to the power of three is big. Yeah, that's, that's really something you don't want to do. And then running all those tests, executing them, this takes an enormous amount of time. So that's hard, and then you have race conditions, which makes it even harder because you have to run all those tests many times to provoke that race condition if there's a race condition. So this makes testing hard, or for my part, fun to do, right? So while people get really upset about the features and, and writing test cases, we think, oh, this is fantastic. The solution is don't write tests. 
Because if you don't write tests, they can't fail either, right? Now, don't write them in the sense of generate the test cases. You cannot possibly write 8,000 test cases for your application. You will not have the time to do so. It's not cost effective. You won't be able to do that. If you could generate your test cases, that would be fine. But of course, you have to generate them from something, uh, not from the code, because then you would probably just generate test cases which will pass the code. But that's not your, the thing you want to do, right? So you need something to generate your test cases from, which is less work than to actually write the test cases. That's, that's the whole idea. So where do we want to generate test cases from? Our idea is to do that from properties. And we'll see how far we get. What's a property, right? I come with one simple example. The property is basically anything which should hold for your system. I'll give you one simple example from uh, the area you're well familiar with, I hope, and that's the XC compression. Any one of you know the AXI compression? No? Yes, you know? So it's XML, if you have XML, and you send that over the wire, and particularly in the mobile network with a little bit, you want to compress the stuff. EXI does that compression. It's, it's a standard for how to compress your message. It's that for mobile clients in particular, you have less traffic going on. Because XML is very verbose, as you know. And you can compress that very effectively. So in this standard, there's something called a round trip property. And a round trip property basically says, and this is, I think, the thing you should, should read here. If you go to, from XML and you compress it, and then you go to XML again, it would be extremely nice if that's the same XML as you started with. Right? That, that's, that's a property. It would be nice if your software, if you compress it and you decompress it, gives the same result. That's where you really want to go to. And then there's something like exact equivalence, not exact equivalence, lots of stuff around. But that's a property. So let's see if we can, can conceptually understand how we would deal with that then. How would we be able to use such a property for testing? Well, first of all, we have to formalize that property. We have to write it down. And I don't have an AXI compression algorithm in my pocket, so I use a library, an Erlang library is zip compression. Yeah, satellite compression. So I will, I will use that instead in my property, and that's this one. And I don't have any XML term, but I happen to have a library or a, a generator for HTML code. So I have something which we call a generator, which generates random HTML pages for me. Okay? So the property would then say, if I compress HTML strings, then I want to have the normal thing back. So for all possible HTML that I generate with my HTML generator, I should ensure that if I compress the HTML and I then uncompress it, I should get my HTML back. Sounds reasonable, right? And this is written in some language called Elixir. Probably not familiar with it. I hope even if you're not familiar with it, you can read this slide. It's not that complex. It says for all the thing HTML code that I generate, you could read it as a logical for all, X is an element of, you could see this as an element symbol of this, this string stuff. You should ensure that this holds. This is all quick check needs to then start randomly generating HTML code and applying that to compress and uncompress and, and check that's the same as the HTML that you have there. Okay, let's run this example. So I have the property here. It's a slightly bigger font. I need a little bit of uh, module definition, but this is really all the code I have to write, okay? If I have my HTML generator. Now I want to run this property. So I open the shell. I do things in the shell. I'm very old fashioned. Mm -hmm. So um, let's make sure I have saved this. Yes, it's saved, so it's fine. I run the unit testing framework from Elixir. And I start quick check here and I fail after one test, okay? Bang, fail. It's not ensured, it says, that this HTML code is the same as this HTML code. You look at that and say, oh, what? And then you see shrinking here. Shrinking is a very powerful thing of quick checks. Okay, you have randomly generated data. Probably your random generation put a lot of junk in there. And probably the junk is not needed to actually provoke this error. So let's take it out. 
So what it does is it has this big term and say, oh, let's take this out. Oh, it still fails. Let's take that out. Oh, it still fails. It takes out as much as possible, and still keeping valid HTML, until it comes to the end where it says, well, this is the smallest HTML page I can generate, and it still fails. Right? It cannot be strong, smaller because I want the HTML tag and the head tag and the body tag to be in there. Right? So I can't get smaller than this. And it says, I fail, and this is not the same. If you are an excellent programmer, you would probably see what's wrong from this one. But I don't blame you if you don't, because I, it took me five minutes to actually figure out why is this not working, right? It, the key is here. Yeah. yeah, you saw it? Okay, excellent, Mike, Michael, uh, super program. So this is, in Elixir, strings are represented as binaries. And this is a really binary string, and this is a non-binary string. And they are not the same. Ah, so I made a mistake, right? I should have read the documentation before I wrote this property, because there's actually documentation on the web. Um, let's have a look at the documentation before we go on. Um, so here we have the, the, the failing test case. And now this is the documentation in, in Erlang, because I use this Zlib library in Erlang. That says, if you compress, you take some data, and then you have your compressed object. And the data should be IO data. Well, probably my HTML string is IO data. I don't know really what IO data is. And I get a binary back. Aha. Uh -huh. And that binary, sh I should put in there, right? No, I should put IO data in there. I'm confused. And then I get decompressed binaries back. That's weird, isn't it? If you think of this documentation, then someone has to copy and paste. People do these kind of things, you know? They, they take something and then instead of writing it, they actually copy and paste it in. This is, of course, blindly wrong in the documentation. It should eat binaries and get decompressed IO data back because that's what you want to back. Okay, so we didn't find any error in the code because our, our generator, our property is wrong, but at least we, we observed that there's room for improvement in the documentation, so to say. Okay, fine. So that was not the problem. So what was the problem? The problem is, of course, that here, I have to make a binary object of this string. So that has to be a real string, an elixir string, so to say, right? And then I'm, I'm happy if I do that, because here I have now a binary, and this one gets IO data. Well, the string is IO data, isn't it? So I compress that, and then I uncompress it, and that's it. Save it, fix my property, understand a little bit now. I learned something about the Zlib library, for example, if the documentation is not correct, and then I can continue. So run quick check again, and oh, I failed again. What happened there? So if you scroll back a little bit, it runs a lot of tests. Each dot is a test case. It's an HTML page that it gives to the compression. Normally, it simply works. But then at 1, at 14.08, 26 seconds, and 300 so many later, it gives me an error. The Zlib driver does kaboom. Right? What is that? Because all those other tests, they just passed. So you start looking into this, what's, what's going on here? Now you start shrinking, right? So you try smaller and smaller and smaller pages where this error actually occurs. So you, you basically don't look at it, oh, this is working, it's working. And then you get your minimum test case here. Your minimum test case in which something goes wrong. And if you look at your test case, you have your binary data here. That's, that's the thing which the compression algorithm produces. And you have your, your string here. That's the string that Elixir takes care of. And something is not, not correct. And it's very hard from this to see what's correct. But if you look at this string, it's, it's all actually here in, in textual form. This is what actually has been produced, or this is what actually has been produced. This is a strange Swedish character here, an A with a circle around on top of it. And it, it produces that. And why wouldn't it, right? It's a style. And then you have N style. Probably you may not write that in there, but why not? But something goes wrong. Now, it's an artifact not so much of the compression, it's more an artifact, again, of my property not being completely correct. What I should have done is, in order to be able to cater for Unicode characters, I should transfer this into a string as well. This is a Unicode string. So if I do that, this is giving me a binary, and if I make that into a string, a Unicode string, it will work better. So let's see if that works. There we are. 100 tests are passing. 
Now I can generate lots of HTML code and I pass. Oh, wait a minute. Now the test manager wakes up. Oh, fine, you tested it. What did you test? Right? That's the first question. If you see all the dots, you say, oh, well, what's he doing? Right? What did you test? So you want to actually see some test output, some, some test data. There are lots of ways in QuickCheck you can say, give me some statistics. I will give you one here. So you can say collect, uh, for example, the pages, and the pages are all HTML, and I want to do this in this property here. So let's run, and it will run your Honda test, and then it will output all the HTML pages you did, and it says how many times it did. So 1% of the test cases, I run 100 test cases, so each, each percent is one. This is one of the HTML pages I generated. Okay, so you have a hat, there are some, some attributes here, you have some very strange characters with a slash n in there, there's, there's a lot of style stuff, there's, there's lots of things going on, right? It's valid HTML, and you can inspect your test cases if you like, and there are 100 different test cases, and these are very big, and in the top I think I have some smaller ones, oh, this was the fitting test case. Here I have some, some smaller ones that I tried as well. Uh, here we have an only catch uh, return or new line and we have lots of things which we tested. This is random data, if I run it again, I get all the random HTML pages. Okay, so that's quick check in a nutshell. This is the basics, so to say, for quick check. Good. I will continue now with uh, so I did this, yes, and now I'm here. Not to switch too often to, between the two. So let's look at eJabbD then, right? Because how do we use this for eJabbD? Well, normally on certain specific parts of eJabbD we use this. And in the preparation of the talk, I said to, to uh, Mikael, what shall I talk about? And he said, oh, I'll do something with XMPP. And oh, you can probably look at this XML parser that we made. That, that would be a nice thing to, to look at. So that's what I did in order to to show you this. For what's an XML parser, if you have a long XML string, you have to read it into memory, right? The XML parser will do that. It will parse that and make a tree out of it. And we do that whenever we want to, to send messages. I mean, ne almost every third slide this morning from Miguel had XML on it, right? Some kind of XML saying, oh, this, this, if you do that, then this is the, X the XML code. So how can we make sure that if you write some XML, and you parse it, that the parser is actually accepting that XML. So some examples that we have seen, well, probably this is not really XML, but there's definitely with streams in there, and with some things of this in there, and yeah, the message, and a from, and a body, and another message. So that, that's the kind of things we want to parse. So eJabbD comes with an XML parser, an efficient, sorry, an efficient one. What does it do? You have this XML parser, you get this XML, you read all the characters in, and you spot out the XML tree, or the, the parse tree. That's a tree structure now. That's just how a parser works. I hope you're all familiar with how that works. Okay? So that's the thing we want to test. Look into the uh, eJabbD open source project, and you will find that indeed there are tests for that, this time written in language X, where X is airline. Okay? This is airline code. You write E unit test, you can do that in any code. But basically what you say is you parse a certain XML code and you get some kind of tree back. So if you parse this code, the tree should be a name and have a root object in the name. And if you have this one, it should actually give the same name. And if you have this one with a little bit of data there, then you actually get a root with one child. This, this is, represents a list with one child in which you have some data. Yeah, that, that's how this, this works. Okay, so you would like to, these are unit tests, now we would like to broaden our thinking and not write 8,000 of those, because that's boring and you don't want to do boring work. So you want to do it differently. How can we use our idea of property-based testing here? So the first thing you have to ask yourself, if I want to do this, where do I get my data from? I run this on XML code, right? So where do you get this data from? Well, you can either write your own nifty XML pages, and that's what has been done in these kind of unit tests. You, you think of something, ah, this might be a nifty case. What's the problem with that? The problem is that you might not consider all the possible XML that's around there. So that, there's a 
a real problem in that sense. Or you just get too bored or distracted by something else which is more fun and you stop writing test cases and you continue doing something else. So that, that's okay for some application areas, not so okay for this. But then there's of course enough XML on the web. So why not just plow the web a little bit, get some XML code in, there's lots of random stuff there if you do it right and you use that for your parser. Then the problem is, how do we get the other side of the assertion, right? Because if you look at this XML code, this, this tree has to be constructed. If you get random XML, it might be a lot of work to construct that, that term, that it should match. And it also would be probably very big and you would do a lot of typing. You would basically manually retype the whole XML term while you're not. You know how people do this? They take a big XML document they type, parse, and what they get back, they put in the assertion. And they say, look, I did my test case. Right? What's wrong with that? Well, you might overlook the actual result, in particular, it's a big test case. You might, the only thing you actually are testing is your parser doesn't crash and gives some output which looks okay. But if you really want to make sure that that data is okay, you better validate that. And if you have validated that, What's the value of your test case in a regression test suite? Well, you might change your parser a little bit, but why is that a good test case for that change in the parser? So there you, that's not the right way to go. Debugging is also very hard. Assume this big XML page fails and you want to debug what's wrong with your parser, that's not too nice. That's where shrinking would help you a lot. So instead of doing arbitrary XML pages from the web, we want to use randomly generated XML pages, and then we use the shrinking for the debugging. That, that's how we want to do that. So, what's the property that we want to use? Almost the same as before. You say, oh, give me some XML. Uh, this is my XML generator. That should me, give me a chunk of XML code. I want to parse it, and ah, what do I have to write there? Is there any idea? What now, right? What shall I write on the other side? Because I, I don't want to write a function that take, takes this and then creates a parse tree. Because then I, I could equally well use this one. So I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. So I don't want to do that. So the key is round trip property. What round trip property could you think of? Well, Christopher, what would you do? <coughs> You would print it, probably. Probably you have already a pretty printer <coughs> in your library. Because when you start sending your XMPP messages to the other side, you would like to send them as text, right? So there is a pretty printer for these kind of parse tree objects. There must be, otherwise you can't send it away. You can only read it, but you also want to send. Okay, let's use that pretty printer, which is there. So pretty printer takes the parse tree, Gets in the printer and then prints this fantastic XML string. That's, that's the whole thing it is. And both are present in eJabberD already. So the only thing we have to do is then use them for our property. So we get a round trip property from XML to a parse tree to XML. That's a simple thing to start with if we have an XML generator. Well, we don't. I can write an XML generator, it takes me a day. So you can use an HTML generator because as far as I understand, HTML is a subset of XML, right? So I can do that. And then if it works for all HTML, I'm probably pretty happy. And I think I postpone writing an XML generator to another day that I, I don't have anything to do. Or I just say, oh, bite the bullet, write your XML generator, it's fine. But what's the problem if I do it like this? So you want to parse your XML and then you pretty print it and you want to compare it to the original XML string. So I did this, where does it go wrong? Can any one of you see that immediately? Have an idea of why this wouldn't work? It has the term minimum that's got a real parser. Exactly, the, the pretty printer's in the way somehow. You, you have several ways of how this, this can go wrong. Uh, most obvious way is all the new lines. So if you, if you have an XML site, there might be lots of white spaces in there. 
And if you pretty print the white spaces, they may just disappear. Which doesn't mean that it's not the same XML, it's just it looks different. But that's okay for XML. So it's, it's very hard to do that on, the, on that level. So you can't really do it. Another way, thing that the pretty printer can do, if it takes this thing as input, where you have body and body with nothing in between, it might decide, the pretty printer, to say, oh, this is actually the same as body slash. And that is actually the same as body slash. Right? So how are we going to do to make sure that this then is always equal? And in particular with lots of new lines and white spaces and things like that. So that's hard, very hard. This is not the way to go. Oh, what a pity. We had such a good idea. And now it doesn't work. Yeah? But there's another way that we can go. We can do it the other way around. Uh, sorry, we've seen those slides. We can go from a parse tree to XML to a parse tree. Because the parse tree is kind of the unique representation of XML. And if you have a parse tree and you would pretty print it, you get some XML, you would parse it again, it should better be the same parse tree. Because the parse tree contains the meaning of your XML. So that's what we want to do. We want to generate XML trees, the abstract form, we pretty print it, we parse it, and it should be the same as the original. Okay, but now I can't use my HTML generator anymore, which I had in my back pocket. Because the, the reason is that each ABD represents XML trees in a certain way. They, they use their own internal record structure. So if I want to do that, I have to actually generate XML uh, parse trees. So I have to write a generator. You cannot use any standard generator because it's, it's kind of in-house, EJBD specific parse tree for us. So how difficult would that be to do something like that? We'll see that in a second. But that's what we are going to do. We are going to generate parse trees and then print them, parse them, and see it's the same. Okay? So the good thing is then that this, for example, this is the, the, the tree. So if I generate this tree, it can either print it in this way or it can print it in that way. I don't know what the pretty printer is doing, but if I pass it again, I should get back that, that pass tree, right? And if I get this one where I have a root, some C data and root, if I have a root and some data in one of my children, there's only one child with some data, then I should better get that, that same pass tree back. So the thing is, let's write a parse tree generator. How difficult can it be? So we go, and uh, I did some preparation here. We go to one of my throwaway my changes that I did just before. Oh, sorry. I'm not a really expert Git user, so I, oh, I did remove the file. That was probably not the smartest thing to do. I should discard, discard the file. That is it. Uh, and now I hope it still works for me. Yes, it did. So now I can go here, revert, and I can show you how we were thinking in this one. So there is a record definition. So. I don't know if you've seen the internals of such a parser, but there's a record definition giving you the data structure and that I have to import. Uh, here's my property. I collect, I want to see if I'm done with testing. I want to see the trees that I generated. And if anything fails during this testing, I want to pretty print the XML tree. So I make an XML tree, I probably make a mistake. So I want to pretty print the XML tree to, to see did I make a mistake doing that. The pretty printed tree is given to the parser and it should return an XML tree. Parsing is done by calling XML stream, that's one of the EJABD modules. And I put the two string text in there such that I'm absolutely sure that the text I give is, is a string. And I parse it by doing element to binary. So I pretty printed by element to binary, another function in XMPP or in EJABD that, that actually does that. Now I have to make parse trees. Let's make the simplest possible parse trees. So how do I make a tree? I, I use this package which says a tree consists of a leaf and a function over all the nodes, over all the children. So 
I can generate something which I have to say how to generate the leaf and how to generate the notes. So the notes, if I get some children, the thing I want to generate is this record structure, XML, with the name root. We saw that in the test case before, so I can use that again. Okay, that's the name I want to use. And then the children that I have there, such that that just propagates down. So I make, in this way, I make my, my tree. So what's a leaf? Well, a leaf, I can do something like this. Let the children be one of either the empty list, then I have no children at all, this is the empty string, or at least nothing in there, or some C data, right? And then uh, it's a note with those children, because the note will then contain the root and either of those children. So this will generate for me an XML, an, a, a structure which is a parse tree. If this goes too quick for you, I will show you the example, so that you see what's happening. So I run my test cases and it shows you what it is actually making. Right? It makes this XML structure where we have a root and then we have root root and C data in there but he has no data and there's a data but there's no data. This has four children, this one has one, two, three children but the third child has three children itself. So we get with very little effort at least all the test cases we had before and a few more. Yeah? You get, you get very deeply nested things very big XML trees with only root in there and C data. And as you can see, I passed 100 tests, so that's fantastic. I can do this. Now there's two interesting extensions to this. First of all, it's a bit boring to see only root, 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 root here, right? So you can make more than only one tag. Let's do that. So I could say instead of this root here, I want to generate a tag, an XML tag. Can write it like this for example um, take any arbitrary thing from my XML tags and then I can write my XML tags here saying this is just a bit programming XML XML tags do and and then in between I write a list with tags and I had root already and I can do message any any other one that you like just for the sake of it. Presence. Presence. Is it like this or with an S? S. Uh, I was thinking. So, and the presence. So now we have those three. That's fine. That's Where's the... Thank you so much. That will much easier compile. So now we'll compile the code, the new code, and then you see now I have messages in there and have root and there's probably even some presence yes there's some presence here so you, you get different trees excellent great this was very simple to test with a richer set of data so let's let's do something more so here we we have c data isn't that extremely boring to always have c data as our data wouldn't it be much nicer to do some similar trick there and write some actual text okay so what is text well to define that can use my, my built-in way of doing text, but I want to write it explicitly here for good reasons. So I say, well, what is text? Text is a UTF-8. That's a binary UTF-8 text string. So I generally use UTF-8s, and that should work, hopefully. Let's see if I made a typo. Ooh, 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 not only a typo. Uh, actually, it compiled, that was not a problem, but then it failed, and says it's not ensured that the thing is, and then it starts shrinking and says, oh, already for the root thing, I have a problem. Right? If I have this XML expression represented by this root, that's not the same as that root. So this is what I generated, where I had the data empty. And if I pretty print this, and then I parse it again, I get this, which makes sense, doesn't it? So what's wrong here in my generator? I should probably not generate the empty string there because you can't see that. Data which is empty, you can't see. It's an interesting test case in itself, but you can't see the difference in the round trip property. So, okay, fine. Then I have to make sure that the UTF-8 strings that I generate are non-empty. So there's a bit of a built-in language here that I can use, so non-empty. Run again. So now I will not have any empty test case. And after 15 tests, the thing fails and says, look, I have this not well-formed invalid token. 
presence, blah, blah, slash AL. Uh-huh, so what's that? Shrinking, shrinks back to root root. So it starts with presence L presence, and the L is actually slash AL, but you can only print it like this. And then it shrinks it to root root, and it says, well, look, if I do uh, in this token zero, then it's going wrong. So this is going wrong, that's going wrong, but I can print it, I can print it. Okay? So what's wrong here? So what's wrong here is that it does not accept my Unicode. It doesn't accept my Unicode in the data. So if I were reading my data from file, and it's a big binary with Unicode in it, and I would just send it in a message, the parser would happily make a string out of it, but the other side would say, oh, oh, this is not well formed. So I can send my file to someone else, and the someone else in the client says, I can't read this. Bang! Not good. We find this by just exploring the set of data, more or less automatically. So uh, you, you probably think, oh, that's because I can't print that data. It's not printable. It's not really Unicode. But I can, because the Pretty Printer accepts it. I think it would be okay if the Pretty Printer says, no, I can't accept this. Because then on the side of the sender, you would already be warned of whether there is an XML function saying that's not valid code, you can't do that, or anything else. But it's not. So I would say this is something to address at least. How can we address it at the moment? Well, we can fix the code if there is such a thing like a fix for that. Or we can say, well, you know, probably we were a bit mistaken here. We probably don't want to have this, this kind of very weird characters, we probably want to restrict the character set, right? So we could say a valid character is, uh, any valid character is 10, 13, and probably, how do I write this in Elixir? I have no clue. Something like this, I guess. 32 is a space, and 126 is the, the right-hand side. So this gives me a list of characters that I, I can use. And then I can say, well, it's a, oh, it still should be non-empty, of course, and it should be a list of those valid characters. So that would be better. And this should probably do the job. Let's, let's have a look at that. This is just a bit playing around. Oh, no, it was a uh, compilation error. Oh, I'm doubting that this is the right way of writing things. In, um, list is a to list does anyone know elixir well enough to help me with this probably not ah no it's like this 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 you can do enum to list this stuff and then you can say well let's do 10 and 13 as well so this this should work you make yes that worked so now I get a very strange error saying that, uh, scroll up a little bit, I can print it. This is where I print it. This is the, the printed string, as you can see. Uh, and the XML data, it says, oh, I can't do that. It's, it's too difficult. And I can, I can explain you the, the reason. I have uh, some slides on that as well. And this can go on and on and on forever, but let's, show you the reasons in more a, pre a nice thing. So you can have some words like root and message as I did, and you have a possibly empty or non-empty uh, set of XML data and text, and then you can run this, and the first thing we saw is that we have an, a Unicode character in there, and then it fails, so I fixed that by writing, restricted to only the ASCII characters like this. That was what I did the last time, okay? So if I restrict it to only ASCII characters, and the 10 and the 13, because I think a 10 and a 13 should be able to, to, to be in the message, right? I mean, control characters we can discuss, but 10 and 13 are not really control characters, so I, I would like to send them in, in my text. And it says, no, 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 your, your property is not insured, because if you generate an, a control R, and you send it away, and the other side is reading it, it will read a control. Uh, a, a, line, a new line instead, which is discussable whether you want this or not, right? Because if on your platform, control R means something, then it doesn't mean that on the other platform that means something. 
And you would probably live with this one, but if you have slash n slash r, which is in some strange operating systems kind of convention, and you would send it away, then you would translate it into slash n slash n. So you get new lines everywhere in between the lines. That doesn't look as good, right? So there you have a problem that you would probably like to address. Okay, that's fine, you can address that. First thing to do is then, uh, well, you cannot distinguish those, but you, you can address at least the problem by taking the 13 away and then just generate. And then you pass over 10,000 tests. So if your XML is only containing the characters 32 to 126 and 10, then you're fine. You can do this round trip. Aha, uh -huh, excellent. Did we forget anything here? Yeah, we did. Because this is super simple stuff. When I showed you the HTML code, there were lots of attributes around. Remember? We don't have any attributes yet. So we did spend quite a lot of time finding certain things, but we haven't had any attributes yet. So we should add attributes to our uh, generator. We do. That's very simple. Put attributes in there. Now we generate attributes and immediately this string doesn't work anymore. Why? Well, I was stupidly forgotten that you, in XML you cannot have the same attribute twice. There's a restriction on that. So how do I fix that? Well, I fix my generator saying each attribute that I generate should be unique in this specific uh, tag. And if I do that, then oh, I crash again. If I send this XML code, which in my opinion is perfectly okay XML code, then I see this strange colon here appearing. And it makes sense if you think about it, because this defines a namespace, and since the namespace is non-empty but a return, it's doing something very weird. But at least I was a bit surprised by by this column in the parse tree, because I would say the parse tree should have said, no, 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 now you're doing really strange things here, uh, instead of parsing it and giving you the wrong parse tree, because that gives you a problem later on. Found this one. So this, this is how you can test with little effort, run far more than 8,000 tests. You can just push a button, you run 10,000 tests, and you have a very rich test set, and you can do this very nicely. Now you can say, oh, that's nice, you can do this, but, who is interested in this stuff, right? This is so basic and, and, and primitive, and of course it's nice that you test this for XML and you find the errors and you fix them, and, and, and eJBD is better, but real software, yeah? software has certain properties, that means things that can happen, and a test case is, is just one kind of verification that this thing holds, but in real software, your properties are far more complex. You don't have round trip properties in your software, no way, right? So if you think of, okay, this is nice, but how can I use it for myself? I have no round trip properties. My software has state. I just can't generate things and then say, oh, run it and then look at it because my software has state. How do you deal with that? Well, we have done that as well, where the properties are then specifications of the API, saying this is the API you can call, these are the arguments you can call in the API, call it, and have, you, you generate a random sequence of test cases, which shrink to the minimum sequence of tests of, of, of commands that actually exposes the bug for you. So that, that's what we use extensively in our work at Volvo or Ericsson or companies like that, but also at EJ, in the eJabbaD case. So you generate a sequence, and that's your test case, and you can shrink that test case. And the shrinking saves you an enormous amount of time and, and work uh, in the analysis later on. So recently, I think last summer, we did this for eJabity hooks. So eJabity hooks uh, is something that you're probably familiar with. You can, you can hook in all kinds of things. And, and I think Christopher actually talked a bit about it, didn't you? you? You mentioned it at least. The hooks we have tested last summer, and it was because uh, Process One wanted to, to migrate more to Elixir. So give you give Elixir kind of input for that meaning there was a refactoring needed, and if there's a refactoring needs, it's nice that the tests are in place. So we wrote some tests for the hooks, and then we, we generated all these kind of API calls with all kind of different ways of calling the functions in order to guarantee that when you write a stupid hook, that the software would say, hey, you were stupid, instead of boom, right? That's, that's the whole 
purpose of it. And we found lots of corner cases which were actually overlooked by the manual testing approach because there are so many corner cases and so many different combinations that you can hardly test it by hand. So that was one thing that, that improved that quality. Uh, there we, we started the random number of EJBD nodes and then we shrink to the minimum number of EJBD nodes in order to provoke the bug. And we tested the add, delete, remove uh, one of all the nodes and, and we do the run and get info on the, all those nodes. So we, we basically make all possible scenarios with those nodes saying this is what we, what we want to test. And we had to do some mocking of the actual hooks uh, that you could give to it. So you can read more at the website from eJabbd for, for details. To conclude, what's, what's the, the benefit of this way of testing? The benefit is that you, you spend less time of writing test code. And less time is about a factor, five to 10 less time in writing test code. But we actually do better testing because we test far more cases and also we generate new tests all the time. You can save the old tests if you like, that's okay. But we generate new tests all the time. So if you use this in regression testing, you get new and new and new tests every time. So you probably one day have this very weird case which you never found before, which will trigger and let you find another bug which you haven't seen in the system before. And there's much less time spent on the diagnosis of a test case because of this automatic minimum minimization of the test cases. So this is a way of, that we use to test eJBD and that we hope that will at least make sure that the quality of eJBD is to your comfort, right? So that's it. Thank you. Yeah.